Welcome everyone. This is Mishnah in depth, Masechet in Darim. It's a part of our Springs Manadrisha with Rabbi David Silver. This class is a part of Drisha's Rivka Rosenwein, Zichon Alavracha, Mishnah Division, and is sponsored in her memory. This class is designed to accompany independent daily study of the Mishnah following the Mishnah Yomit schedule. We will meet weekly as a community of learners to argument our independent study, enhance our understanding of Mishnayot learned, and support each other as a community of learners in the daily study of this foundational text. Teaching this um, uh, chunk of Mishnayot is Rabbi David Silber. He is the Dean and founder of Drisha. He has, teaches extensively on the Bible, has several publications, including most lately, Malchut Adan, Iyun Besefer. He previously taught Mishnayot with us, and we're glad to have him back. And I would like to, if you are joining on Zoom or Facebook, we do very much want to hear what you have to say. Do not hesitate to ask questions, whether that's in person or in chat. I will bring them to Rabbi David, David Silver's attention if you ask in chat. If you are in the attendee section in Zoom, I'm also happy to either unmute you or make it so you can speak or, or relay your questions. And with that, I'm gonna hand things over Rabbi Silver. Thank you very much. Okay, so this is a new track day, a new Masechet, and uh, it's called Masechet Nidarim. Nidarim we typically translate as vows. So this is a track day that deals with vows. Now, what vows I will get to. Um, this is actually quite an interesting topic uh, on many different levels, raises all kinds of questions. Uh, the Mishnah actually relates to them, I would say, more tangentially. The Mishnah is a very brief text. The Gemara spells out some of these questions in much greater detail with the commentaries. But the Gemara is picking up on the Mishnah, and the Mishnah raises a very, in, a, in a very uh, brief way, in other words, doesn't spend a lot of time talking about it, but it explicitly and implicitly raises the core questions. Let me begin with a very simple question about Masechet Nedarim. Simple question, which is this. Masechet Nedarim, it's 11 chapters long, and it deals with vows. So as we all know, the Mishnah is divided into six sections of Sedarim. So the first one is called Zrayim. It deals with things that grow from the ground, and maybe blessings you make on things that grow from the ground. But fundamentally, it's about different kinds of laws that relate to the agriculture, in other words, things that you have to take when you have a field, you have to give to the poor, you have to give to the Kohen, you have to give to the Levi, uh, you have to bring some of them to Yerushalayim, to the to the, to the, to the Mikdash, such as first fruits. There are certain restrictions that apply for Allah, for example, in the first three years of the growth of a tree, all kinds of rules. That's the right. And then you have, um, you have Moed, which deals with the, the, the festivals, starting with Shabbat and the other festivals as well. And here, in the, the Seder that uh, we have, uh, the Seder Nashim, that deals called the Seder of Women, and it deals with questions such as marriage and divorce, uh, leveret marriage, which is the first of the tractates in Nashim, followed by Kituvot, the, the uh, rabbinic understanding that marriage is not just a personal relationship, but a financial one, the obligations that the bride has to the groom and the groom to the bride, the Ketuva, what is the Ketuva, all of these laws, all of these rules are found in Masechet Ketuvot, other things as well. But, so, Nashim begins with Yevamot, with leveret marriage, and the second tractate was tractate Ketuvot, which I assume some of you had been learning. The purpose, as uh, as, as Kayla said, this is basically just an assistance for those going through the tractate. We'll, I will point out several things about the mission. But the question is, why in the world is tractate Nadarim in Seder Nashim? What does it have to do with women? Is that about marriage or divorce or leverage marriage? or financial responsibilities of marriage. It's not about the adulterous woman or the woman suspected of adultery, the Sota. What is it doing here? It's actually very interesting that in the order of the tractates, and fundamentally, for the most part, they're in size order, the number of chapters. 
But after Nadarim comes the tractate Nazir, someone who declares herself or himself a Nazir, and the rules attended upon Nizirut, but Nizirut is a kind of vow. So tractate Nazir follows upon tractate Nidarim. But of course, this begs the question, what in the world is Nidarim doing in Seder Nashim? That's the question. And to which there is a clear answer, I think. I can only think of one answer, and the answer I was taught. Uh, the Rambam, I believe, says this in his commentary on the, on the Mishnah, that the reason it's in Seder Nashim is because in the Torah, the Torah speaks uh, in chapter 30 of the book of Bamidbar, about a situation where a girl or a young woman takes takes a vow. And the Torah says in chapter 30 that when the woman takes a vow, if she's still in her father's home, she hasn't reached her majority yet, she's a katana, then on the day that the father hears about the vow, he can nullify the vow. He can only nullify it on the day that he hears it. But on the day that he hears it, he has, he, he, has a, he has the right to nullify it, and the vow is um, the vow is null and void at that point. Um, if she's a married woman, then uh, if, on the day the husband hears it, he can nullify the vow. But if he doesn't nullify it on the day that he hears it, the vow stands. That is known as hafarat nidarim. That's what it says in the Torah. Your fair, your fair, your fair, your fair, her fair. Hey, pay resh. That's called Hafarat Nidarim. The last two chapters of Masechet Nidarim deal with the topic of Hafarat Nidarim. So that's the clear connection between vows and Seder Nashim. Because the, the man in her life, either the husband or the father, has the right upon hearing it only when on the day that he, that he hears it. He has the right to nullify the vow. It's called Hafarat Nidarim. Of course, one could ask the question, if this is the connection to Seder Nashim, why in the world are the laws about Hafarat Nidarim in chapter 10 and 11 of this 11 chapter tractate? Why isn't it in chapter one? That's a very good question. I don't have a good answer to that at this point. But in general, the order of the Mishnah is very strange. That's chapter 11 and 10. Chapter nine of this tractate deals with a different rule a different law, which is one probably familiar to many of us. It's not hafarat nidarim, it's hatarat nidarim. Hatarat nidarim that maybe many of us are familiar with is if someone took a vow and for whatever reason uh, has thought about the vow or the oath, we'll discuss vows and oaths soon, but vow and oath, uh, and the person who wants to get out of it, wants to nullify it. The rule is, that you may go to a, a baitin, exactly what constitutes a baitin, when we get to that chapter, we'll discuss. But if you go to the baitin and you show cause, that is to say, you say, I took a vow, but I didn't realize the, the consequences of the vow. I'm sorry I took it. We'll discuss how you do it, but basically that's the basic idea. The court can say to you, the vow was nullified. That's called hatarat nidarim, not to be confused with hafarat nidarim. But the two things obviously are related. So hatarat nidarim sneaks into this tractate through hafarat nidarim, which deals specifically with a wife or or or, or, a, or a daughter. And there are other rules, are very interesting, and we'll get there. That's where Hatarat Nidarim comes in. And we find this throughout the town with Babri and Yushami, discussions of Hatarat Nidarim. The concept, the idea that you can nullify a vow or, or you can uproot the vow called Hatarat Nidarim is a very interesting concept. And the Mishnah elsewhere, for those who uh, study Mishnah, you probably remember that in the tractate called Chagiga, uh, the Mishnah says, strange Mishnah, right in the middle of tractate Chagiga, Heter Nidarim Porchin Ba'avir, Vienu Ahem Amashi Yismoku. The Mishnah says that the idea that after you take a vow, you can get out of it by going to a court and saying you made a mistake, you didn't realize the consequences, etc. That rule 
of Hatorat Nidorim floats in the air and has nothing to, it's based on nothing. In other words, what the Mishnah points out is when, if you read your Bible, it doesn't appear from the Bible that that is possible. That if you take a vow, you can somehow get out of it. It floats in the air, that has no basis. That's called Hatorat Nidorim. And that's found in Tractate Chagiga. I, um, when we had the memorial earlier this year for Rifka Rosenwein, I was very honored to be part of that. I gave a shear, and I talked about that Mishnah, actually, Hetan Nidarim Parkin Ba'avia. So those are the last three chapters of this tractate. And the Hafarat Nidarim is the reason that we find this tractate in what's called Seder Nashim, together with the Yavamot and Ketuvot and Gitin and Kedushin and Sota. We expect that. Um, so that is the presumably the reason for the placement in Seder Nashim, but those are only the last three chapters. Chapters one through eight are not about that at all. They deal with all kinds of other issues about Nidarim, which are extremely interesting. I would say that Tractate Nidarim in general is a very, very interesting tractate. And especially, and I'll give a little introduction now, especially since the definition that the Mishnah gives us of a neder seems to be completely un- disconnected from what would appear to be the definition of a neder when you, when, you, when you read the Torah or when you read your Bible. So let me just get into that by way of, this is by way of introduction. Now- David, can I ask you one question? Yes, of course, yeah. Um, you said that on the day he hears about it, he can, uh, now that's the first time in other words, the nader could be have been in an effect for a long time, but this is the first time he hears about it, or is this the first day that the nader is in effect? No, it's the first day he hears about it. Oh, it's been okay. in effect for a year. Okay. He can notify it only when he hears and only on that day. If he doesn't notify it on the day, uh, then you can't notify it. By the way, the non we'll, we'll see this later, but non notification can take two forms. One is he hears about the nether and he says, okay, that's what she wants to do. Fine. It's okay by me. That's that there he actively affirms the nether. Then there's another way that he can affirm it by saying nothing. He knows about it and he didn't complain. If he doesn't complain, then the vow stands. Now, this is true, by the way. I'll get into the vow and what, what is the vow in, in a minute. But let's just I want to, let's draw our attention to the first Mishnah in Masechet Nidarim. The Mishnah starts in a very strange way, as the Mishnahis usually start. Not what you expect, but the Mishnah starts with Kol Kinu Ye Nidarim Kinu Darim Becharamim Kacharamim Ushvuot Kishvuot Unizirut Kinizirut. Now, the Mishnah begins by saying, we'll have to see what this means, that a kinui, a kinui of a neder works to create a neder, a kinui of a cherem works to create a cherem, a kinui of a shvua works to create a shvua, and a kinui of nizirut, become a nazir, works to create nizirut. The Mishnah at this point doesn't yet explain what a kinui is, but let's just suffice it to say, it's some kind of a speech act. It's a statement which is not all that clear what, what it means. And we'll come back to that. It's one of the topics of the first paragraph or two in this tractate. The, and we'll get to this Mishnah. The Mishnah says some interesting things over here. But let me just start by pointing out that the first Mishnah in tractate Nidarim mentions four kinds of things. Neder, Cherem, Shvua and Nazirut. Okay, so we'll define a neder very soon. There are four things mentioned over here. Neder, Cherem, Shvua, and Nazirut. What's interesting is, this is the Mishnah. The Rambam wrote a, a great code called the Mishnah Torah. He called it the Mishnah Torah. And what the Rambam does basically is reorganizes the Talmud, or the two Talmuds. He reorganizes it. He doesn't necessarily follow the commentary of the Mishnah. The, Rab, the, 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 the Rambam wrote a commentary on the Mishnah, by the way, which is very interesting. He actually wrote a commentary on the Mishnah. 
But it, when he has his Mishnah Torah, he doesn't follow necessarily the order of the Mishnah. For example, the Mishnah mentions four things, throws four things together, Neder, Cherem, Shvua, and the Zirut. When you look at the Mishnayot of the of the of the, of the Mishnayot that we have, Rabbi's Mishnayot, right? The Neder is in is in Seder Nashi. The laws of Neder are in Seder Nashi. The laws of Cherem are in Kachim, the Seder that deals with with, with 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 the temple and the various donations to the temple and the vows made to the temple. Shavuot appears in the Mishnah in Seder Nizikin. It appears not in Nashim at all, nor in Kachim, obviously. It appears in the in, 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 in Zikin. And the Zirut appears in Seder Nashim. It's an extract day. So of the four things mentioned in the Mishnah, actually, two of them are in Nashim, one is in Kachim, and one is in the Zikin. When you open up the Rambam, the Rambam divided all the all the laws of the Talmud, all the laws of the Torah into 14 sections. And he has in a section called Hafla'a, which means pronouncements, making statements. He has four, it's a short, in the Rabbam, the short book, maybe his shortest book. He has four, four sets of laws in his book about making pronouncements. He starts with Neder, then he has, he has Nazirut. I think he starts with Shvuot, actually. Shvuot, Nadarim, Haramim, and, uh, and the Nazirut. He actually has the four things mentioned in the Mishnah, the first Mishnah, in, in, in Manadi's code. Those are the four things in the, in the book he calls Afla pronouncing. So that's the Rambam typical does this. I mean, the Rambam's ability to organize things is phenomenal, and he organizes it in such a way that you can, it makes perfect sense. He's the great organizer. But the Mishnah is the Mishnah lists these four things. I wanted to talk briefly about. What is a neder according to the Mishnah? And this is actually very important. This has implications not just for the Mishnah of the Sefer Nadari, but you immerse yourself in the study of the Talmud. This comes up all the time, actually, and it's a fascinating. It's very fascinating. So let me pull, let's let's first think for a moment where the Torah mentions the word neder. I'm not talking about the stories. There are a couple of stories where neder appears. Let's leave that for now. But where does the idea, the concept of a neder, come up? In, in the Torah. So a neder typically comes up in the Torah when somebody is bringing a sacrifice or donating to the temple. It's actually very interesting. Let's, if you want to give something, you want to bring a sacrifice. You, you have an animal. You want to bring the, your animal as a kind of sacrifice, a burnt offering, a, a goodwill offering, a thanksgiving offering. The law is you don't just walk into the temple and, 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 and sacrifice the animal. Before the animal is sacrificed, you have to de- you have to declare it as a sacrifice. That's called it. That's called hektish. You're maktish the animal. You can't just bring the sacrifice. It sort of reminds me, in a way. I'm not sure the, the analogy is perfect, but it reminds me of the rabbinic idea that before a couple gets married, living together, they have to have kedushin first. So you don't just jump into marriage. You start with Kedushin, Kedushin is sanctity, sanctification. So analogously, if you want to bring a sacrifice, you want to donate something, property to the temple fund, it's called Bede Kabayit. It takes the form of you must be Makdish first. Now that, that being, this animal, Hareze Ola, Hareze Shlamim, Hareze Matanu Bede Kabayit, etc. Those kinds of things, that act, that speech act, of donating something to the temple, whatever it is, either a sacrifice or other kinds of things, that is called a neder. That's a neder. I'm saying this animal is going to be a certain kind of sacrifice. I set it aside for that purpose. I declare it so. That's what we call a neder. That's the neder. Nidre hegdish. That's the typical neder in the in the Torah. A makdish something. Okay. And that's called it the lengthens the act. Right. It, well, it makes it in a way it's right. It, it's sort of preparing. It's anticipatory. This, uh, so it's not just a one time thing that you're bringing it, but you think right. about it and you. Yes, I agree. Now, by the way, the neder, neder in that context takes two forms. Because you can, you can be mocked as an animal in two different ways. You can say, 
you can say this animal, this animal in my backyard is going to be hareze shlamim, hareze ola, hareze whatever. That's one kind. I declare this particular animal to be the sacrifice. Or you can say something else. You can say, not this particular animal, but hare olai shlamim, hare olai ola. There you're saying, not just this particular animal, maybe you didn't single the animal out yet, but you're saying about yourself, I have obligated myself to bring a carbon shlamim. What is the difference between these two statements? Simple. Let's say, let's say I pointed to my animal over here, Elsie the cow or something. I want to bring Elsie as a carbon shlamim. Unfortunately, Elsie died. If I said Elsie is a carbon and Elsie died, that's it. I'm not responsible to bring another carbon. I said this animal is a carbon. That in the Gemara is called a nadava. But if I said I accept upon myself, Hare Olai, to bring a shlamim, maybe I had Elsie in mind. But if Elsie died, I got to bring a different animal because I that's called a nether. So nether and the dava, they have a very specific, in addition to a nether being the act of sanctification, uh, they can take two different forms. And that is typically when the Torah speaks about a nether, that's what the Torah is talking about. Volunteering to give something to, to the temple, to, to what's called hegdish. Now the different, the different ways you can give to hegdish, there's sacrifices, Hegdish can own property, et cetera, et cetera. But that's an act of Hegdish. That's a nether. That's one kind of nether. One kind of nether. What, the, what Tractate Nadarim comes up with, which is quite remarkable, Tractate Nadarim makes the claim that when you read the Chumash, you encounter another kind of nether. And you encounter this other kind of nether, it just turns, so happens, in the very same chapter, which talks about a, ma- a husband or a father uh, nullifying the vow of a wife or daughter. In that same chapter, which is chapter 30 of the book of Bamidbar, which talks about hafarat nidarim, that very same chapter, according to the Talmudic understanding of the chapter, talks about somebody who takes a vow, and the vow they're talking about in that chapter, according to the Talmudic understanding, the Mishnah's understanding, is not about somebody who says, this animal should be a sacrifice. I'm going to bring a sacrifice. I'm going to donate money to the temple. But it's something completely different. It's where I say, it's where, it's where I forbid something on myself. I walk over to my bookshelf and I say, these books on this shelf are, are, are forbidden to me. I'm not going to read these books on the shelf. I'm not going to benefit from the books. This, this food in the fridge, uh, I, I declare and I may nether that this fruit, all the fruit in my fridge, is forbidden for me to eat or to benefit from. It depends how I formulate it. That is completely different. It's not a sacrifice. It seems to be something unrelated to sacrifice. And that is called a nidre isur. Okay. That is this jumping off point for this tractate. Now, one can raise a different question, which we're not studying the whole the Gemara. But one can, in fact, ask a very interesting question. By the way, when you talk to a guy, the Shiva boy, and he asks about a nether, right? So you straight out, when a nether is where you, where you forbid the object on yourself. That, you know. But actually, when you look at the Chumash in chapter 30, it is very far from clear that, that is what the, that's what the Torah intends to say. The Rashbam didn't think so. The Rashbam thinks this concept is, is, is in the Talmud. He accepts it. But it's not, it doesn't seem to be in the Torah. The Torah doesn't speak about that. He thinks when it, the Torah speaks about a nether, it's always donating, donating something to Hegdish. Be that as it may, whether, whether that's the Pshad of Chumash or not, be that as it may, but this is the concept of a nether. Now, because this is the concept of a nether, we run into a very big problem, which the Mishnah will deal with, several Mishnah will deal with, the Gemara deals with it, and it raises, it's one of the one of the main topics of the first couple of chapters, which is the following question. If, in fact, what a nether means is I'm forbidding something, I, 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 I want to forbid myself to eat, to eat this apple. I can forbid myself with anything, right? I can forbid myself, presumably, anything. We'll see if that's true. Then what in the world is a shvua? Because a shvua, as the Gemara understands it, 
based on the verses in chapter 5 of Vayikra, what they call the Shvua Bitui. Bitui is a, a pronouncement. A Shvua, according to the Gemara, is where I make the following statement. It could be one of four statements. And there's a separate tractate called Tractate Shvua, by the way. This tractate is Nadarim. But, but when you study Nadarim, you have to think about Shvua. Because what's a normal Shvua? I mean, there's Shvua's you take in court and all that. I forget that. But a Shvua means, I say, I take an oath that today I'm not going to eat any, any, uh, any fruit. For whatever reason. Maybe I want to start a diet. I take an oath, no more carbohydrates. I take an oath, no more sugar. No, nothing with sugar. You can take any kind of oath. You can take an oath, I'm not going to sit in this chair. You can take an oath, uh, I'm not going to benefit from so-and-so. You can take any kinds of oath. That's a valid oath. That's called the Shvua Pitui, which then raises the obvious question. If that's what a Shvua is, and we're now defining Neder in a similar way, I'm saying this fruit is, I'm not going to eat this fruit, right? Then what in the world is the difference between a Neder and a Shvua? That is one of the central questions that emerges from the beginning of this tractate. I mean, it's an obvious question. They seem to be absolutely the same thing. Once you define Neda this way, and by the way, I point out, there was not necessarily a good reason to do that. There's always a reason, whatever the reason may be, but uh, so what is the difference between a Neda and a Shur? Do you know, does anybody know what the difference is between a Neda and a Shur? What actually, according to the Mishnah, what is the difference between, and I'm going to tell, say this to you, and some of you may laugh, but don't laugh. Uh, this is in the Mishnah, and it's very central to the Mishnah. The difference between a neder and a shvua in the Mishnah is the difference between two terms that the yeshiva boys overuse every day. The guys who learn the yeshiva know this distinction, and they beat it to death. But the distinction in the Mishnah is a real one. It's a very simple one. When I take an oath, a shvua, what I'm saying is, I'm forbidding myself to do something. I take an oath, I'm not going to eat a piece of fruit. I'm saying I am forbidden to eat the fruit. That's a shvua. But I could formulate it differently. I could say something else. I'm not saying I can't eat this piece of fruit or I can't eat any fruit. I'm making a different statement. All fruits are forbidden to me. Rabbi so I'm not talking about my... I got a, just a question from someone in the attendees. Yes. Um, Minda, I'm going to unmute you. Yes. Okay. Uh, my understanding is a neder, if you want to retract, you must bring an offering of some sort. And an, and shvua is, is more open? No, that's not, that, that's not accurate, no. Sorry? That, that's, that, that's not true at all. That's, that's not the distinction between them. We'll, we'll, we'll get to many distinctions. That, that, but that distinction is not the distinction. The main distinction in the mission, and we'll see this, comes up in several Mishnayot, as I just said, which sounds like a very trivial distinction. A shvua, according to the mission, is I say, I, David, I'm not going to eat any fruit. You can make any. Not going to eat any fruit for the next month. Not going to eat fruit for the next two hours. Not going to eat fruit for the next... You can say anything. I'm forbidding myself to do something. That's a shvua. If I don't say that, if I say, this fruit that's on the table, or all the fruit in the store, I'm not going to benefit from this fruit for the next 30 days. Sounds like exactly the same thing. That is a neder. Or in, the, or in the words of the typical words, a shvua is an isagavu. A shvua is where the, you, I, I'm forbidding myself to do something. A neder is where I forbid the, the object on myself. Now, you may ask the obvious question, what, sounds like just, just language. What is the difference? It amounts to the same thing. But the Mishnah has a set of distinctions between these two, which are very interesting. So that's, that's, that's the jumping off. Very important to understand this. That is shvua, shvua bitui. There are other kinds of oaths. But the oath where I forbid myself to do something, that's a shvua. If I, if, I forbid, if, I, if I say the object is for, or the thing is forbidden to me, that is a neder. Now, I'll give you, let me give you one example. The Mishnah has several differences between them. But let me give you an example of the difference between them. The, I'll give you two, two differences over here. Let's see where they're found in the Mishnah. A, this is an introduction, but I do want to touch upon the Mishnah. Let me see if I can find where the Mishnah actually says this. Um, hold on one second. No. Um, 
Just one second, please. Yes. Um, for example, um, uh, for those following along in their own machine, where is chapter this? Chapter two, just one second. Chapter two, Mishnah, Mishnah two. Chapter two, Mishnah two. The end of the second half of chapter two, Mishnah two. Mishnah says, Zechomer Bishvot Bibinadarim, Bechomer Binadarim Bishvot. There's a stringency that Shavua is more severe than a Neder, and there's a stringency that a Neder is more severe than a Shavua. Ketzad. So the Mishnah says, Ketzad. For example, Omar Konem Sukkah Shani Ose, Rule of Shani Notel, Tfilin Shani Me Neach, Binadarim Osir. This is a fascinating Mishnah, truly. I, I do. I, I must tell you that Masech is so is, has many, many interesting issues which come up, and some of them are pretty basic religious issues, which we'll get to later. But the Mishnah says a very strange thing. We know there's a mitzvah to sit in a sukkah or to take a lula. These are mitzvot. Suppose I say. Suppose I say. I'm taking an oath, I'm not going to sit in the sukkah. I'm taking an oath, I'm not taking the ruach. I'm taking an oath, I'm not going to put on tzilin. So the Mishnah says, that oath, that shavua is not valid. That shavua does not take effect. Because you cannot swear to violate a mitzvah. That's what the Mishnah says. But the Gemara has a very interesting formulation why you can't swear to violate a mitzvah. Because the Gemara says, because when we stood at Mount Sinai and accepted the Torah, we were mushba behar Sinai, as if God imposed an oath upon us to sit in the sukkah. And therefore, I can't take an oath, my own personal oath, to undo the oath that the Jewish people accepted when we were given the commandments. That's the, that's the formulation of the Talmud. But the bottom line is that if you take an oath, not to perform a mitzvah, the oath does not take effect. That isn't that surprising. What is surprising is the first half of the Mishnah, Mishnah, Mishnah number two in chapter two. Kol names Konim Sukkah Shani Oser, Ruach Shani Notel, Benedari Moser. I didn't say I'm not going to put on tefillin. I said tefillin are forbidden to me. This sukkah over there, or all Sukkot in the world are forbidden to me. Says the Mishnah, in that case, I'm not permitted to sit in the Sukkah. I have forbidden the Sukkah to myself. In other words, the point of the Mishnah seems to be that if I forbid, I'm not saying I'm not going to sit in the Sukkah. What I'm saying is the Sukkah is forbidden. Oh, I want to go sit. I'm about to walk into the Sukkah. I said, one second, I can't go into the Sukkah. That Sukkah is forbidden to me. So indirectly, in, in point of fact, I've taken a neder, which prevents me from fulfilling the mitzvah. That's indirect. And according to the Mishnah, that neder is, actually takes effect. And I would have to try to be matir the neder. I would have to go to a court and to, to nullify the vow. That's a distinction between the neder and the shvua. That's a very interesting distinction. And it raises all kinds of interesting questions. That's one distinction that we have in the Mishnah. I'll give, tell you another distinction that we have. Uh, We'll find it in the Mishnah. I'm not going to search for it now, but it's in the Mishnah, which is this. Suppose I say, I take, I, I take an oath. I'm not sleeping for the next two days. I, I, I'm not going to sleep. I swear I'm not going to sleep for the next two days. That's a shvua, talking about myself. That shvua takes effect. That's a valid oath. I swear I'm not eating today. Uh, well, that's a bad example. I'm, uh, sleeping is better. I'm not going to sleep for the next two days. Okay, says the Mishnah that Shavua is, is effective. But if I take a neder that I'm not going to sleep for the next two days, that's not valid. Why not? Because when you take a neder, it has to take effect on something. Sleep is, is an abstraction. It's not something you can touch and feel. I mean, it's real in the sense, it's an experience that's real for us. But the Mishnah thinks that a neder can only take effect on an actual object. So these are two distinctions between the neder and the shvua. 
There are many other distinctions between a nether and a shvur that we'll get to, but this is a this is one of the interesting and critical topics in the beginning of this uh, tractate. And let me mention one other rule about a nether, which which connects us to what I mentioned at the very beginning. The first mishnah in 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 in, uh, in tractate nedarim talks about kol kinuye nedarim kinedarim. It starts by talking about kinuye. But then, as the Mishnah continues, it says something different. It says, the first Mishnah, In other words, the first Mishnah, first Mishnah, Mishnah 1, chapter 1, Mishnah 1, the first Mishnah seems to have two different statements in the first Mishnah. The, 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 the Gemara says the Mishnah is formulated very cryptically, you have to sort of maybe think more broadly what it's trying to say. The Mishnah has two different concepts, which are very important for us in the first couple of chapters. What is called the Kinui. Kinui. Kinuye Nadarim. We'll get to what Kinui is in a moment. But the cases that the Mishnah gives, Mufrashari Mimcha, Murukhali Mimcha, Mudrali, not actually a Kinui. The Mishnah has a different term for that which is the word yad. What is the difference between a kinui and a yad? This is the basics of the tractate. A kinui is a word, well, let me, before, before we get to kinui, let me get to the core idea of this. When you take a nether, what you are doing is you are saying some object is forbidden to me. Now, where is that coming from? So, the, so we'll see what the Mishnah, Mishnah, not today, but maybe next time or the following time. You have something very interesting. Suppose I say, this comes up later in the Mishnah. Suppose I say, this piece of bread over here, I want it to be like a sacrifice. I want it to be like a sacrifice. That is an, 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 an effective nether. In fact, that is at the core of what a nether is. According to the Mishnah, what a nether actually is, is I, there's a piece of bread on the table. I'm permitted to eat bread, why not? Piece of meat, an apple, fruit. I give the example of eating. Of course, I, I'm allowed to eat these things, why not? But if I say, in effect, this piece of fruit should be like a sacrifice, then the piece of fruit becomes forbidden. In other words, I started by saying there are two kinds of nadarim. There's hektish, where I give something to the temple. I call this, this animal a sacrifice. I give it a name. I maktish it. And then there's the other business. I forbid myself to eat things that are basically permitted to me. There's no prohibition. The bread is totally fine. Nice kosher piece of bread. But I can, I can create a prohibition. That's what's amazing. I can create a prohibition, but apparently... The creation of the prohibition can be seen as, as called kind of extension of, of the other rule of hektish. I can donate something to the temple and it becomes holy. I can say this piece of bread, which is not holy, should have the status of a holy object. That's that. This lies at the core of a of a, of a nether. But the Mishnah says later on, suppose I, suppose I say this piece of bread should be like a pig. To be like a forbidden, a forbidden uh, animal, forbidden to eat. This woman or my wife should be like my mother, who's who's forbidden to me. That doesn't work. It may work at some rabbinic level, but fundamentally, it doesn't work. And we have a very important distinction in the Mishnah, and the Gemara runs with this: the difference between a davar hanadur and a davar haasur. A neder. When, when I forbid something which what which would normally is permissible to me, the very, the very fact that you can do that actually, that you can create your own prohibitions is quite incredible. That's what the Mishnah assumes. Maybe we'll talk about that sometime, about the sort of philosophical idea of a nether, theological idea of a nether. But you can do that only when you connect the nether to a to, to a sacrifice or to something that has hate kodo, something holy. It's as if you are expanding the kedusha of its carbon to include this object. But if I say this piece of meat should be like, like pig meat, 
which is forbidden, that's that nether does not take effect because the 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 the, 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 the pig is not forbidden because it was an act of sanctification. The pig is called the Dabra Asr. The Torah forbids certain things, as they do with the temple. They have to do with Hektish. So that doesn't work. So a neder, this is a very important point, a neder, this nidre Isser and nidre Hektish. The Rambam talked about these two kinds of nedarim, but there is a connection between the two of them. An important connection between the two. Okay, let's let's see. Let's, let me stop here and take any comments or questions, and then we'll proceed. We still have time. Plenty of time. Um... Debbie, did you have your hand up? And Minda, I still see a hand up. If you have a question, I'm happy to unmute no, you. No, I'm fine. Okay. Uh, Minda, I saw a hand up. Is that still the case? Okay, I guess not. Um, okay. We want to hear your All thoughts. Right. Okay. So we've, we've, said, we've said a lot of things over here. Let me just let me get back to the distinction in the first Mishnah between Kinu and Nadarim. And the statements in the Mishnah, if someone said, I am, I, I am distant from you, I'm separated from you, those kinds of statements. Now, I'm far away from you could mean many hundred different things. It doesn't have to necessarily mean that I am forbidden to benefit from you. See, in the case of a neder, you, you're both allowed to say to someone, I'm not going to get any benefit from you. This comes up later in the tractate. It's called the Mudar Hana. I could say, I'm not going to, I take a nether not to benefit from you for whatever reason. I don't want to give any benefit for you. You are, you are, I am forbidden to you, or you are forbidden upon me. I can also say to you, from now on, my, everything I have is, is, is forbidden to you. You can do that also. That, 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 that nether works. The problem that the Mishnah deals with is, and this is central to the tractate. This is one of the central issues in this tractate, which has far-reaching implications. What the tractate is concerned about, among other things, is, in one word, language. Remember, the idea of a neder, which is remarkable, is a person can, on her own, create prohibitions. You can, you can say, this food, this apple pie, is forbidden to me like a sacrifice. And then it becomes forbidden like a sacrifice. You can say that. That's incredible, actually, when you think about it. But that is what the Mishnah suggests. That's how they're reading the Chumash. It's not clear the Chumash said that, but that's what the rabbinic understanding. Okay. But what about if I don't say it in such a clear way, or I say to somebody, uh, I, am, I, am, I, I am distant from you. We wouldn't automatically assume that what I'm saying is I'm not for, I'm, I am forbidden to benefit from you. So those kinds of statements, okay? Statements that can be understood in more than one way. What am I really saying? Maybe, maybe I'm just saying, you know, I, I don't think we get along very well. When we, we're together, we fight. I'm distant from you. So the, the, the Mishnah has several different terms, several different formulations. And the Gemara will deal with the formulations. But those kind of formulations, that is to say, a statement which can be read more than one way, or a statement which we might say is a kind of incomplete language. That's not called the kinui in the Talmud. That's called the yad. Yad's like a handle. In other words, I didn't say the whole thing. I didn't say, I didn't say, hanoatech asura alai. Your benefit is forbidden to me. It's forbidden upon me. That would be a, a regular formulation of a nether. I didn't say that. I said, I'm distant from you. I'm, I'm, I'm far away from you. I'm not, I'm not going to eat from you. I'm not going to taste. Those statements, according to the Mishnah, actually work. And the Talmud has a whole discussion, basically, how far you go with this. How, how, um, how, how close to the, other, to the standard language does it have to be? And it also raises, we'll see later on in the, in the, in the Mishnayot, another very interesting question question, which is, what about if someone says something and we're not sure what they meant? So do, do, do we say the person is, we're not sure what they meant? But so just for now, we'll, we'll deal with that Mishnah later, not, not today. So what, 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 what is the default position? Is the person that made that unclear statement forbidden? The Mishnah seems to say yes. On the other hand, what about if you come afterwards and you say, I, well, I actually meant this. What about if you give, give an explanation? 
maybe even a far-fetched explanation. The Mishnah seems to suggest that we follow your, that we, that we believe you, and that the, the vow is then not binding. In, in short, and it's not hard to understand, the idea of language is something which is central to this tractate from beginning to end. It's about the power of language, but it's also about interpretation. Language is there to give you, give us, convey information. And the question is, how, how do we interpret people's statements? What right do they have to reinterpret their own statements? These are the issues that emerge in this, in, in the, in this tractate. Okay, let me mention one other issue that comes up in the first chapter. In the first chapter. Actually, in, not just the first chapter, in the first Mishnah. First Mishnah. The Mishnah says, Mishnah has different formulations of, of, of a vow. Um, and Mishnah seems to say that it discusses whether these, whether these, whether this particular language is effective to create a net, that is to forbid the thing upon myself. The Mishnah has a very strange uh, discussion in the Mishnah, disagreement in the Mishnah in the following way. If we see to the second half of the Mishnah, four lines before the end, right, right there, Kinidre, right there, you see it, two lines on the left. Kinidre Rishayim, Nadar ben Nazir, Uva Karban Uva Shur. Kinidre Kesherim, Ro Amakum. The Mishnah makes the following amazing statement. Someone takes, someone's taking a, 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 someone wants to take a vow. And someone says, I'm going to, I want to forbid this object on myself, the way wicked people take an edit. Or I want to take the vow of Nizirut, the way wicked people take an edit. I want to bring a sacrifice, the way wicked people, a, a mockish an animal to bring a sacrifice. I want to take an oath, the shvua. The way wicked people do that. If I make that formulation, then the vow and the oath take effect. But if I said Kenidre Sherin, I want to take a vow, I want to forbid this on myself, the way righteous people do. According to this formulation in the Mishnah, Lo Omar Kum, that vow does not take effect. Now the question is why not? It sounds like the strangest thing in the world. So this formulation in the Mishnah bespeaks a very, very big question in general about the whole tractate, which, which the Talmud discusses at length. The Mishnah hints at it. But I just want to put it out there, and with this we'll stop with, with this thought. It's a very simple question. The Mishnah says, and the tractate, the whole tractate, the tractate says that people can take oaths, shluot, where I say, I'm, I, I, I swear I'm, I'm going to do X, I swear I'm not going to do X, okay? That's, that's an example of an oath. There are other examples too, but that's an oath. Or I say, this fruit is forbidden to me. This, this object is forbidden to me. That's a nether. Here's the question the Mishnah raises implicitly. Taking the dari, is that a good thing or a bad thing? That's what the Mishnah is suggesting. And this Mishnah seems to say quite an amazing thing. Good people don't take oaths. That's what the Mishnah says. Sherim. A kosher is a kosher, a kosher person, a good person. Not a saint necessarily, but a good person. If I say I want to take a vow the way the way good people take vows, that statement is not effective. Because good people don't take vows, says the Mishnah. No good person would take a vow. If I say I take a vow the way wicked people take a vow, okay, maybe I shouldn't have done it, but the vow takes effect. And this raises a very basic question. It's true of vows and it's true of oaths. And now the question is, this particular Mishnah, and there are other Mishnah out as well, but this particular Mishnah seems to be saying that taking a vow is not a good thing. And now the question is, why is taking a vow not a good thing? Now the point is, the discussion about whether taking a vow is good or bad, one of the main texts that deals with taking a neder is not found in the Torah, but it's found in the fifth chapter of Kohelet, Ecclesiastes. The, the ch ch chapter five of Kohelet, if you want to bring that up over here, is the central text in terms of Neder. It's actually a very interesting text. Let's see if, let's see if Kayla can bring that up. Um, I would be glad week, to, any, partic any particular Pasuk? 
just the beginning, the first few verses. Just the first few verses of it. First five, six verses of chapter five of Kohel. Let's see. That's it. Al Right. Let's see. Keep your mouth from being rash. And let not your, I can't read it, just scroll down. Let not your, so it be quick to bring forth speech. God is in heaven, you are on earth. That is why your words should be few. Don't talk too much. That's the first verse. Let's read some more. Right. Dreams come with much brooding. Foolish utterance comes with much speech. Coke, seal, but the fool talks too much. Now look at the next verse. Kasher ti elohim when you make a vow to God, do not delay to fulfill it. It's talking about a vow where you donate something, like an animal to the temple. God has no pleasure in fools. What you vow, fulfill. Okay, you took a vow, make sure you fulfill it. Now look at the next verse. Scroll down a bit. Let's see that. Yes. Tova shaloti dar. It is better not to vow at all than to vow and not fulfill. Right. So we'll stop at this point with these, with these verses. But the question is what is, what is what is the import of these verses over here? What is Kohelet saying? Is Kohelet saying, listen, be careful, be careful when you talk, be careful when you take a vow, because you might not fulfill it. It's better, right? It's better not. It's better not to take a vow, than to take a vow and not fulfill it. But the open question in chapter five of Kohelet is: But maybe does that mean you shouldn't take a vow, or does it mean if you do take a vow, make sure you fulfill it? But if you did fulfill it, that's a good thing. But maybe just be careful. Or is Kohelet saying something different? You know, don't just keep your mouth shut. Don't don't shoot your mouth off. Just keep quiet. You took a vow, make sure you do it, right? And if you take a vow, fulfill it right away. Don't delay. Because there's a good chance you won't fulfill it. If you do fulfill it, that's good. But which is better, to take a vow and fulfill it or not to take a vow at all? So in the Gemara, there's a debate. Two Tanoim have a fight about this. Which is better, not to vow at all? Or, or, or no, if you take the vow, you fulfill it, that's better. Now, why would, why? Why might we say you shouldn't take a vow? Why should you not take a nether? So there, there are two possibilities here. One possibility is what, what Kohelet seems to be concerned about, which is, listen, if you take a vow, you've obligated yourself to God. Who knows if you're going to fulfill it? All kinds of things could happen. You could forget about it. As the next verse says, you could make a mistake. You could be just lazy. There are a hundred different reasons you get tied up with something else. There's a lot of different reasons that you might not fulfill your vow. Therefore, says Kohelet, play it safe. Don't take too many chances. Better not to just keep your mouth shut. Don't, don't take vows. Don't, don't do extras. Just do what the Torah tells you to do, and you'll be better off. That's one possibility. That the concern is a practical concern. right? Not a theoretical concern. Vows are fine. But the chances are you won't, you, you, you may not keep it. And then you violate something. We'll, we'll, we'll discuss, not today, what if you do violate it? What, what are the penalties? That's a different discussion. Next, we'll, we'll jump into, into a lot of Mishnayot. In any event, there's another possibility. And this possibility comes up in both in this tractate of the Darim and also in the next tractate of the Nazir. In fact, uh, if any of you remember the chapter of the Nazir, which is chapter six of the book of Bamidbar. So the um, so the Nazir takes the Nazirut is a vow. Let's start with that. Very important. The Nazir becomes a Nazir through a neder. I don't want to get into that too much now, what kind of neder it is, whether it's Nidre Hagdish or Nidre Isser, that's an interesting question. But it's it's a neder in any event. So the Gemara has this debate, a big debate about the Nazir. Is the Nazir doing a good thing or a bad thing? Rashi in Chumash, quotes an opinion of Rabbi Lezer HaKapor. He was a Tana. And Rabbi Lezer HaKapor said that someone who declares herself, himself to be a Nazir, 
is 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 a is a sinner. At the end of the Nazarite vow, you bring sacrifices, including a sin offering, a korban chatat. Rabbi Yehuda Hakapar assumes if you bring a korban chatat at the end of the Nazarite vow, the completion of the vow, you must have done something wrong. Why would you bring a sin offering? That's what he claims. I don't think that's the case in Pshat, but that's what he says. So he says, I'll tell you what the sin is. You took a, you, 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 Nazar is not allowed to drink wine. It's an extract tape. Nazar may not drink wine. <laughs> says the Lazar HaKapar, but the Torah says that you may drink wine. We make Kiddush on wine. Wine is a good thing, he says, in moderation. But wine is, wine is permissible. Why God gave you wine to enjoy? God gave you wine to drink. Says Rabbi Lezer HaKabar, when you finish the Nazarite vow, you bring a sacrifice, a sin offering, because you have you absented yourself from the wine. You absented yourself from worldly pleasures which are permissible. Impermissible is one thing. Wine is permissible. Too much wine can get you in trouble. But wine is permissible. So Rabbi Lezer HaKabar says the Nazarite is a sinner because the Nazarite forbade himself or herself something which is permissible. Now, when it comes to not a Nazarite, but a regular vow, you can make the same argument. You could say very simply, the Torah says there are 613 commandments, 248 positive, 365 negative. You're coming along and saying, I take a nether, that food is forbidden to me. I, I forbid that food on myself. You can make the argument, who asked you? God is God, God. God is the legislator. God tells us what is permissible and not permissible. The Torah says it's permissible. Who are you to make it forbidden? Well, what is? What are you, God or something? So you can make the very same argument. And then it's not about you're not going to fulfill the vow. You'll fulfill the vow. But it's the very vow itself which is problematic. This is the question that the Gemara discusses and I think it's obvious to all of us. It's actually a very interesting question. In other words, the idea that you take upon yourself additional restrictions. What do, you, what do we make of that? Do we think that's a positive thing? Do we think it's a negative thing? And it, it, it reflects itself, as we will see, in the question of, you know, like the formulation. The first Mishnah in the tractate Midarim, Kinidre Rishayim, Nether, Kinidre Kesherim, Boramakorim, because Kesherim don't take Nadarim, Rishayim take Nadarim. That's the first Mishnah. The Gemara has a huge discussion, huge debate, and it comes up in a whole variety of settings. So let me just review what we saw. This is, today's an introduction. Uh, I wanted to touch on some of the basics of a nether. The first point is, what is a nether, actually? And the rabbinic understanding of nether. I may discuss next week, what is what does a nether mean in the Torah? What's the pshat of the Chumash? It's not this. What is the actual pshat of a nether? It doesn't mean that this at all, but this is what the Mishnah says. So you have... It's very similar to a shvua, except that one is I forbid myself to do something. That's a shvua. And in Edir, I forbid the, the thing on myself. But the Quran is a chevz, the object's forbidden to me. And there are some distinctions between them. They, what, some cases one works, in some cases the other work. That's, that was point number one. Point number two, not, not in any particular order, that the Mishnah comes up with a new concept, totally new. You can actually get out of the Edir. You can be matir and netter. When you read the Chumash, it doesn't sound that way. And that's related to something else, which is to annul, the, to annul a netter by a father or a husband on the day that the father or husband hears it. That's called hafarat nedarim. Those are the three chapters at the end of this tractate. Okay. Then we raise the question about is this a good thing or a bit? Then, then the two other points. <laughs> we distinguish between two things in the first Mishnah. A kinui and a yad. So a yad is an incomplete statement. The neder at the, at the heart and soul of Nadarim is the question of language. What about an incomplete, an incomplete statement? Does that create a vow or not? In the beginning, we'll deal with next week, the first Mishnah, a kinui. A kinui is not an incomplete statement. A kinui is something else that we'll talk about next week. So this is by way of introduction to, to Nadarim. I find the Dharim in general, because of some of the questions that it raises, a very interesting topic. So we will, again, not going to do every Mishnah, and it's Mishnah Yomi, then there's a lot of Mishnah each week, a Mishnah a day. 
but we will I will jump around and try to touch on what are the key Mishnayot in this in, in this tractate. So we'll jump we'll focus in on the key Mishnayot and next week we'll really start just looking at the Mishnah and moving from one Mishnah to the next. Anyway, thank you so much. Looking forward to uh thank studying you, the second Nidarim. If anybody has any questions, you can, you can always email me first of all. Dsilber at drisha.org. Any, any questions or anything I said or that, that clear, please be in touch and I will try to respond. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Rabbi Silver. Thank you, everyone, for joining, whether you're continuing from previous sessions or jumping in. It's a pleasure to see you. I hope to see you all next week at the same time, 1 p.m. Eastern time over Zoom and Facebook Live. Take care. Thank you.